Imagine what God would want from you on Christmas. That anticipation that we all feel at Christmas time, especially as a child, that anticipation of Christmas is right around the corner. As adults, we think, oh, we have three weeks and I've got to get everything done, I've got to get everything decorated, I've got to buy all the presents. But the kids, they get all excited. The night before Christmas, they're all anticipation. Many of us have moved our Christmas, whether it's the Christmas Eve and the kids, hey, can we open up a couple presents? And, and we try to move everything up. But the anticipation of Christmas, the anticipation of what could be. Luke, in his book, um, started off a chronological order of the life of Christ. And starting off in the life of Christ, he starts with a, with a story about a priest and his wife. And as they start with this story of the priest and his wife, the priest's name is Zechariah, and his wife's name is Elizabeth. And the Bible says in Luke chapter 1, verses 5 through about 20, that, that they were priests, and there was about 180 priests in the kingdom, and, and every year the priests would come to the temple to, to honor God, and the temple was where the Holy of Holy was. And once a year, all the priests would come and they would draw lots to find out which priest would be able to go into the Holy of Holies to offer sacrifice. And out of all of the priests, at this particular time, Zechariah was chosen. He was chosen, so he went into the Holy of Holies. And when he went into the Holy of Holies, he burnt the sacrifice. And all the, the smell was coming through the temple and right behind the curtain was the ark of God. And the ark of God in the Holy of Holies is where the presence of God dwelt. So after he burnt the incense and after he started honoring God through his prayers, all of a sudden, on the right-hand side of the altar, an angel appeared with great fear and trembling in Zechariah's heart. He was terrified. And the angel said, as all angels, fear not. Well, you know, if you see an angel, you, there's going to be some fear going on. Now, those people that said, oh, I saw an angel, and the angel, no, an angel. Can, can you imagine, even if you dial down angelic angels to a one, they're over the top, almost scary. Let me, let me tell you how scary they are. Let me give you a scripture. In uh, 2 Kings chapter 19, verse 35. That night, the angel of the Lord went out and put to death 185,000 in the Assyrian camp. When the people go the next morning, they were all dead bodies. One angel, 185,000. That's pretty powerful. And when Jesus was about ready to go to the cross, he said, guys, put your sword away. Do you not know that at my word... I could call God, and he could give to me 12 legions of angels. And now, a legion in the Roman camp, of the Roman army, is three to 6,000. Could you imagine, if Jesus wanted to, he didn't because he submitted himself to the will of God, and he died on the cross for your sins and mine. But if he desired, if he got so scared, or if he said, I'm not going to do this, he could have called 72,000 angels from heaven to this earth. And if one angel could kill 185,000, at God's will, 13 billion, 320 million could have been put to death instantaneously at God's will. At the time, there were a little over a billion people on the earth. Right now, there's only 7.21 billion. Jesus submitted himself to do what he wanted to do, and that's to die for you and I. So when Zechariah saw an angel, and the Bible says there was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zechariah of the division of Abijah, his wife was the daughter of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth, and they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and the ordinances of the Lord blamelessly. So here, Zechariah was at the altar, an angel appeared, and Zechariah was a righteous individual. He knew 
the Old Testament. He knew all the writings. The Bible says that he kept all the commandments. And he said Elizabeth and him were righteous. And they were from the line of priests. And he, their dad was a priest. And their dad's dad was a priest. It was, they lived in a bunch of, it was a preacher's household for generations and generations. So they understood the law. They understood the word of God. They said that they kept the commandments. And they were righteous. They did what God wanted them to do. And they were blameless. When God looked at them in a microscope and, in, and he looked at their life, he said they were blameless. So Zechariah knew what God wanted him to do. He knew the past. He knew the word of God. And when he saw that angel, he was terrified, scared. Not just, hey, there's an angel. He was scared to death. But the angel said something. The angel said something to him that he and Elizabeth had been praying for for their entire life. They're well up in age. They're probably 80 years old. I mean, they're way over the top. I'm 50, and they were like way older than me, like 80, 90 years old, but they were still serving Jesus. And they were praying for one thing. Their entire life, they had no child. And at the custom of the day, of a woman that could not have a child, was there was a reproach against her. Everybody looked at her and said, there must be sin in your life. There must be something going on because you can't get pregnant and you're, and you're barren. So everybody looked at her like, why can't you have a child? They were faithful. They served God righteously. They were blameless before God. But yet she was without child. And they prayed all their life for a child. They couldn't have it, but they were faithful. I'm sure they said, God, why don't you honor me? I have done what you wanted me to do. I've been faithful to you my entire life. Why can't you just give me what I want? I just want a child. But yet God was silent. You're faithful, but why don't you give this to me? And sometimes at Christmas season, we have the fears, we have our desires, and maybe there's some pains, and maybe we're on our knees before God asking us to deliver us, asking us to give us something, and we feel like God is just silent. We feel like he doesn't care. We feel he's not there. And that's exactly what Elizabeth and Zechariah could have said. But in their faithfulness, they honored God day and night, serving him as priests. They wanted something, but just because they didn't get what they wanted, they didn't quit doing what God called them to do. And sometimes in our life, we say, God, I need this, God, I want this, and God doesn't deliver on our timetable. And if God doesn't deliver on our timetable, sometimes we say, you know what? It just isn't worth it. But that's not what they did. That's not what they did. In verse 13, But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer is heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine or strong drink. He will also be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. And we will turn many to the children of Israel and to the Lord of our God. He will also go before him to the spirit and the power of Elijah, to turn the hearts and the fathers to the children, and the disobedient to the wisdom and the just to make ready for the people prepared for the land and for the Lord. Jesus himself calls John, John the Baptist, the greatest man ever born of woman. Why would Luke start his book off in the chronological order of the life of Jesus with the story of Elizabeth and, and Zechariah and the birth of John? It's because he was important. He, John the Baptist, the birth son of Elizabeth and Zechariah, was going to prepare the way and proclaim the name of Jesus Christ. But Zechariah, he didn't understand it. In verse 18, and Zechariah said to the angel, How shall this be? For I am an old man, and his wife is well advanced in years. That's a pretty smart dude, isn't it? I'm an old man, but my wife, she's, she's well advanced. In other words, my wife is as old as I am. She's an old lady, but I think Zechariah was smart enough and inspired by God enough to say, somebody's going to write this down, and 2,000 years from now, somebody's going to read this, and you're going to get in trouble if you call your wife an old lady, okay? So you don't call your wife an old lady. She's well advanced in years. Renee, you're well advanced in years. You're, you're not old. You're well advanced. It's very smart to say that. 
So he was very wise what he said. But he, he said, how can this be? How could this be? In other words, what he's saying is, why, don't you, why didn't you do this when I was 20? Why didn't you do it when I had some life? Why didn't you do it when I had some energy and I could raise my child and I could go play football with my child and I could do things with my child? Why did you wait till I'm 80 years old instead of when I'm 30? Why? Because he didn't understand it. He didn't understand the concept. He understood the only person that he ever heard that was going to do what he was going to do was uh, Abraham and, uh, and Sarah. They could do it. They did it back in Genesis, but that's, a, that's in the Old Testament. That's not going to happen to me, but it did. It did. Verse 19, And the angel answered and said to him, Listen, dude, I am Gabriel, who stands in the presence of God. Why are you doubting me? Do you not know I speak for God? I stand with God, and I have come here to you after 700 years of silence, and I'm telling you the very thing that you've been praying for, I'm going to deliver it, and you doubt me? How could you do that? Why can you ask and not be thankful? How could you say, I need something, but yet it's not on my time frame, and because it's not on my time frame, I'm going to be upset. Why don't you just fall on your face and say, thank you, but you doubt. And so often what we pray for, and we don't deliver, and God doesn't give to us on our time frame, we have some anger issues. We doubt what he's going to do. In verse 21, um, let's go to verse 19. And the angel answered and said to him, I am Gabriel who stands in the presence of God and was sent to speak to you and bring you these glad tidings. But behold, you will be mute and not able to speak until the day these things take place because you did not believe my words which will be fulfilled in their own time. Doubt God. And he said, he said, listen, you've been praying for this. And I want to give you something. But because you doubt me, you're going to be mute until the appointed time. Now, I like the word appointed time. Now, what that means is, this is I've got this. God is in heaven looking at your life, hearing your prayers, Zechariah. At the appointed time, you're going to be with child. Elizabeth is going to give child. The appointed time, Zechariah would say, what is that? You mean you know what's going on? And I'm sure Gabriel would have said this. Dude, 4,000 years ago, sin entered into this world. And when sin entered this world, you were put on God's mind. And your life has had been on a collision course for this exact moment. Do you think that you casted lots to be in the Holy of Holies by accident? Do you think God brought me down here by accident? Your name, your son, your life is on a collision course. You have prayed for it. God is going to deliver it. And God has given to you the very desires of your heart. Don't doubt, except when you pray for something, if it's God's will, God will give to you and God will orchestrate what you need and what he has so what we have will be used of God. So when you look at that, he was mute. He couldn't talk. He comes out of the temple and, and the priests that were sitting outside praying and worshiping, he's been in there for a long time and they started wondering, why isn't he coming out? What, what's going on? We see the incense being burned, but all of a sudden he walks out and, and they're all saying, what's going on? And, and they said he motioned to him, but he couldn't talk. And after the time that he was sent at the temple, he went back to his house and five months later his wife, she, she stayed in the house for five months and then when she came out, she was great with child. And the day was accomplished that she was going to deliver. What was a reproach on their name became a blessing. And they said, thanks to God to re from removing the reproach from our family. What was negative, God turned to a positive. God turned things to a positive on his time frame. So when you're looking at what you desire, 
Luke started off with something I believe that we can look at. We have been praying for something. We desire something. We miss something within our life. And we're saying, what's going on here? So I want to take that story, and I want to give you some principles. The first thing is, what are some, some questions that we have when we're praying for something, when we long something? We're, we're looking at something, we say, hey, I desire this. It may be health issues, it may be financial issues, it may be all kinds of different things. And we're on our knees before God, and we feel like God is kind of deaf, and he's not paying attention. We feel like, I'm just praying, it's repetitious, it's, nothing's happening. What do I do? Just like Elizabeth and just like Zechariah, you stay faithful. They were righteous and blameless in the sight of God for years because they prayed to God, although they were not getting what they wanted, they did not doubt and they did not fail God because they didn't get what they wanted. They were faithful. For years they were faithful. God hadn't spoken in 700 years. Their, their, their country was in disarray, but they were faithful. They were faithful to God in all circumstances. They never quit. So here, here's some points. Consider how God is preparing your life. Just consider when you're saying, why can't, why, am, why my prayers aren't being answered? Why don't we just consider that how God is preparing your life? Maybe, just maybe, the thing that you're asking for, you are not ready to receive. Just think, maybe God has got something better for you than what you could ever possibly think. John the Baptist is a little bit better than any other son that was ever born of woman. We could pray for something, but at God's time, when God wants to deliver it, it's going to be the greatest thing possible that you could ever have. So look, am I preparing for what God has given to me? What am I praying for? What am I desiring? So what I have to look at is I have to look at what should I do now to receive what God wants to give to me into the future? I can pray, but not only just praying with my words, I must actually do what God calls me to do. So evaluate it. And the second thing is comprehend how God speaks to your life. Comprehend how God speaks to your life. Um, this story is a, is a miraculous story. It's um, a, a, a birth, an announcement, just like Abraham and Sarah in the Old Testament. Now we have Zechariah and Elizabeth in the New Testament. Just like Gabriel coming to him and speaking to him and foreknowledge of the birth of John the Baptist. We may not hear an angel. We may not see an angel. But God speaks through others, and he speaks to us through prayer. And when we are praying for something, and we are seeking something, we have to be totally focused on what God is giving to us and what God is doing through us. How do we do that? What we pray for. And the Bible says pray for everything. Pray without ceasing. So when you see what God wants to do, how does God speak to us? He takes the word of God, and God can never do something outside of God's word. If God's word says, this is what I need you to do, we can ask all day long, but God cannot do something contrary to his word. His word is absolute truth. His word is concrete. So if, if, if you're asking God to break his word, I'm telling you now, God's not going to break his word. He, he's absolute. He's the alpha, the omega. He never changes. So God's word. So we have to look at what does God want? God wants us to honor him. And when God sees that we honor him, just like Elizabeth and I and Zechariah honored him, God starts working within our life. And Zechariah said to the angel, how shall I do this? He, he had questions. How should I do this? How, how's this going to happen? We have to have faith in God. God is going to communicate to us, but we have to listen to his words and how he talks to us. The third thing is clarify how God evaluates your life. Clarify how God evaluates your life. I love the way that Luke communicated about Zechariah and Elizabeth. He is evaluating. And when he evaluates your life, he looks at us and says, this is why, or this is why you cannot have the very thing that you said. If he cannot trust you with the little, he is not going to give you the much. In every area of our life, we have to be faithful to God in the simple things. And if we are faithful to God in the simple things, God sometimes blesses us with great things. He evaluates what we do with what we have. If we cannot be faithful 
before he blesses us, sometimes we are never going to be faithful after he blesses us. God wants to look at our hearts and clarify how he evaluates our life. We have to do that. And then four, contemplate God's plan for your life. Contemplate. What would I be like? What would it be like if the very thing that I've been asking God for, he delivers? Think about what you're praying for. Think about the needs that you have. When God is silent and contemplate, what would it be like? You know, when I do marriage counseling, I, we talk about the dream stage. Talking about what would your utopia life be like? You know, they got these young couples sitting here. They're, they're 22 years old, and, and they're just in fabulous love with each other, and they're thinking about everything. And I said, tell me what your life would be 10 years from now. And she's all sitting over there holding hands. Well, I'd like to have a big white house with a picket fence, and I'd like to have three kids, and I'd like to have a dog, and I'd like to have, you know, $100,000 in the bank. You know, they give me this, this dream stage. I said, oh, wouldn't that be awesome? Let me tell you what reality is going to be like. <laughs> okay. So in the dream stage, we think, what, what would your life be? I believe we should have a picture of what God wants to do within our life. What would it be like And Zachariah and Elizabeth had a desire and they had a need, they stayed faithful, and then he said, how could this be? How could this be? How could it be what you're going to tell me to do? How can I even do it? And Zachariah said to the angel, how shall I know this? For I am an old man and my well, wife is well advanced in years. In other words, they're looking at, they're saying, I understand what you're trying to tell me, but I can't do it. And I'm telling you, the thing that God wants to do with you and for you and through you is something that you probably can't do yourself. If you can take care of every need that you have, you wouldn't need God. But the thing that we're praying for the most is the thing that God wants to deliver you in. And the only way that you're going to be successful in what he delivers you in is if you are faithful to God before and after. It's like Zechariah, how can I do this? I am Gabriel. I stand at the throne of God, and I'm speaking for God. And I tell you, your prayers have been answered. And not only the prayers that you, you ask for, I am giving to you much greater than you could ever possibly think. And when you think about what God wants to do within your life, God wants to great, do great things with you and through you. But here's the issue. Even in our prayers, we have to concede to the disciplines that God wants to put in our life. Because sometimes we look at disciplines as punishments. And I don't necessarily believe every discipline is a punishment I believe discipline is motivation to do what God wants us to do. Because he doubted, Zechariah was a mute for nine months. He could not speak because he doubted the very words of God. Now, in that, I believe that outwardly you would say, why would he do that? Why would he do that? But I believe internally, he goes home. His wife is pregnant and for nine months he's watching his wife and he's remembering the promise of Gabriel he's seeing what God has done and he sees I could not do this without God and when she conceives and has a child the Bible says he opened up his tongue and he worshiped I believe sometimes the reason why we don't get to do sometimes what God wants us to do is sometimes when we receive God's blessing, sometimes we think it's us. We think I deserve it. Sometimes when we go through his disciplines, after we ask for his blessings, it's because after we have gone through discipline, once we see what he's doing within our life, when we receive it, then we've been disciplined in understanding it was from God and then we can open up our hearts and our lives and we can say thank you. I can't get this and I can't do this without you. After nine months, when the days were accomplished, when it was right for God, when it was on his time frame, 
when it was at the moment that God ordained 4,000 years earlier. It was right then his tongue was loosened and he worshiped God. John the Baptist was born. Listen to this very next verse, which I think is awesome. Verse 26 is right after he worshiped God. Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel, same Gabriel, was sent by God to the city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And having came, to the, came in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. John the Baptist was a great birth. Next week, we're going to talk about a greater birth. Talking about our Lord Jesus Christ. We're talking about anticipation. Looking forward to what God wants to do within our life. My challenge is very simple. The thing that you've been praying for. The thing that you've been longing for. The thing that you need God to deliver for you. The thing that you need God to repair within your life. With anticipation, look for it. With anticipation, ask God for it. But with anticipation, be prepared to be prepared. Be prepared to see what God is doing within your life. And if God is saying, I want to, but you're not ready to, you have to be prepared to be ready before God can deliver. So often we want to fix it now. And God wants us to be fixed. Then he can deliver. Our prayers are so real. Our needs are overwhelming. But just like Elizabeth and Zechariah, they were righteous and blameless before God. They prayed daily for a blessing, and they never received it. And you would tell them, you're too old, it's too late, God doesn't care. But at the right time, at God's time, the real time, he delivers something greater than they could possibly ever think of or even ask, God delivers. Be faithful. Be righteous. Be prepared. When you feel like you're all alone and you feel like God isn't listening and you feel like I'm just going to give up, go back to Luke chapter 1. Listen about these two individuals that they were faithful during the circumstances when everybody else was abandoning God. I won't. When everybody else was laughing at them, saying, you know what? You're supposed to be a priest. You're supposed to be this religious leader. And God isn't even blessing you. What have you done wrong? I am going to be faithful. I don't care what people say. I'm going to do what God wants me to do. I will not quit. I will be faithful. I'm going to be faithful because God is faithful. At his time, he will deliver what he wants to deliver within our life. And it will be greater than you could possibly ever think or even imagine. What do I want for Christmas? I want God's peace. I want God's love. What does he want for Christmas? He wants you to be faithful and blameless and righteous before him. He wants to give to you gifts that you can't ever possibly imagine. You can't buy them. They're only from him. And if they're from him, they'll be the best present ever. Let's go to the Lord and pray. Dear Father, Lord, we come before you. We thank you for the story of an old man, an old woman that was faithful to you, but doubted. And you blessed them above measure. And Lord, we too need you. Many of us need you to touch our lives. Maybe it's our health. But Lord, we need you more now than ever before. We want to be faithful to you in every area of our life and protect us and guide us in our life and our responsibility. And let us be that presence that you want us to be, that you need us to be, to love others and to serve others and to honor you and to worship your name. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen.